You are literally never gonna believe where I am right now. I am on Earth. In fact, every living thing that we've ever discovered has been alive on Earth. But what about the rest of the solar system? Could life be possible anywhere else? Well, the short answer is yes. Life is possible in many more places in our solar system than you would expect. So let's go explore those places. Other planets, moons, dwarf planets, asteroids, let's go through it all. Let's find out where life could be hiding. Before we search for life out there, let's talk about life right here. Earth is our only proven example of a living world. It's gonna be our template. Life here thrives because of a few key ingredients. Liquid water, a protective atmosphere, a magnetic field, and a mix of chemistry and energy. So as we look to other worlds, we're asking, could they have something like this? water, chemistry, energy, maybe even protection. And if so, then maybe they could host life too. All right, let's take our little spaceship here and let's go to the first stop of our journey, Mercury. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. It's a scorched, airless rock, blazing hot on the one side and freezing cold on the other. No atmosphere, no liquid water, and although it has a weak magnetic field, it's not nearly enough, so it's not a good candidate for life. Let's keep moving. Second stop is Venus. Venus is often called Earth's twin because it's about the same size, but that's pretty much where all the similarities end. Its surface is an absolute nightmare. We're talking hotter than an oven, over 460 degrees Celsius, and the pressure down there would crush a submarine. So yeah, the surface has no life. But here's where it gets a little bit interesting. Up in the clouds of Venus, about 50 to 60 kilometers high, the conditions are way more reasonable around 30 to 70 degrees Celsius, still not great because those clouds are made of sulfuric acid, but it's not impossible for microbes to survive up there. Back in 2020, scientists thought they found phosphine gas in the clouds, and on Earth, that stuff is mostly made by microbes, so some people got excited. But the follow-ups were kind of disappointing. Later studies couldn't really confirm it. What's really cool though is that Venus may have had oceans billions of years ago, like actual liquid water on the surface, before it turned into the hell planet we see today. So it might have once been a lot like Earth. Could life have started there and moved up into the clouds as the surface went bad? We don't know, but it's definitely one of the weirdest and most intriguing places to keep an eye on. All right, Venus, we're heading out. Everybody give a round of applause for Venus for being such a good sport. Now the next stop of our journey is Mars. Mars is probably the most famous place in the search for life. Today Mars is basically a frozen desert with a super thin atmosphere made of CO2. There's no breathable air and it gets blasted by solar radiation. But it wasn't always like that. Billions of years ago, Mars was warmer. It had valleys and lakes, and it was way more Earth-like. NASA's Curiosity rover even found mudstone in Gale Crater, evidence of a long-lived freshwater lake that existed over 3 billion years ago. That same spot had organic molecules, energy sources, and all the right chemistry for microbial life. It's honestly one of the best shots we have at past life outside of Earth. And then there's the methane mystery. Curiosity rover has been keeping track of low levels of methane in the atmosphere. And weirdly, it changes with the seasons. 
We're not sure what's causing it on Mars, but scientists can't rule out that microbes living underground could be an explanation. And speaking of underground, there might also be liquid brine lakes under the ice at the South Pole. And we know there's frozen water just under the surface of lots of places, so if there's still life on Mars, it's probably hiding deep below, living close to warm spots near heat sources. Mars may not look lively now, but the signs are all there that it once was, and maybe still is. Now it is time to go to our new destination. In the asteroid belt, there is a small dwarf planet called Ceres, and that's where we're headed. Ceres is the biggest object in the belt between Mars and Jupiter, and technically it's a dwarf planet, around the size of Texas. The cool thing is, Ceres is loaded with water. NASA's Dawn mission found signs of liquid water that once flowed beneath its surface, like a salty underground ocean. And based on our models, about two and a half billion years ago, Ceres might have had enough heat from radioactive decay to power hydrothermal activity basically underwater vents. That's a big deal because on Earth, those vents are full of microbes. So at one point, Ceres probably had the full recipe for life, water, energy, and organic molecules, the stuff to support single-celled organisms. Currently, it's probably frozen and quiet, but back then, it could have been alive. And for a dwarf planet in the middle of the asteroid belt, that's pretty amazing. Now, the next planet we're gonna go to is the biggest one in our solar system, Jupiter. Jupiter itself is not a great place for life. It's a giant ball of gas with no surface and brutal radiation. But the exciting stuff is Jupiter's moons. Let's start off with one of the most exciting places in the entire solar system. Europa. This ice-covered moon is really fascinating. NASA's Galileo spacecraft found strong signs of a huge subsurface ocean. We're talking more liquid than all of Earth's oceans combined, sitting beneath about 10 to 15 miles of ice. And here's the really important part. The ocean is sitting on top of a rocky seafloor. That means water is in contact with rock, and that's a big deal. Here on Earth, that's exactly where life loves to hang out, around hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor, where chemical reactions provide energy without needing sunlight. Europa could have the same thing going on there, powered by tidal heat from Jupiter flexing the moon like a stress ball. And there's more. Hubble and other instruments have spotted plumes of water vapor spraying out of Europa's surface. If those plumes are real, and it looks like they are, we might be able to sample the ocean without even landing. Just fly a probe through the spray. And the Europa Clipper is doing exactly that. So Europa has water, energy, and chemistry. Basically everything life needs. It's one of the top picks for finding life beyond Earth. Next up is Ganymede, the biggest moon in the entire solar system. It's also got subsurface oceans. Ganymede's water is expected to be around 60 miles deep, so it's got tons of water. Now, it's not just as simple as ice on top and ocean underneath. Ganymede's structure might be more like a giant icy club sandwich. Ice, ocean, more ice, maybe even multiple layers, but if any part of that ocean touches the rocky core, then you've got potential for hydrothermal activity, which means possible energy for life. And here's something cool. Ganymede is one of the only moons with its own magnetic field. That gives it some protection from radiation, and because it orbits a bit farther out from Jupiter, conditions here are a little less harsh than Europa. NASA's JUICE mission is actually heading there right now, and it'll go into orbit around Ganymede in the 2030s to study its ocean in detail. It might not be as promising as Europa, but it's definitely still in the conversation when it comes to potential life. Now let's quickly take a look at Io, one of my favorite moons. Io is not a good candidate for life, but look how cool this moon looks. Most people don't even know this is in our solar system, so now you know. 
now we're gonna head to a planet that everybody loves. The Lord of the Rings, Saturn. Saturn is just stunning, but as far as life goes, the planet itself is a no-go. It's a giant ball of gas with no solid surface, wild storms, and not much chemistry life could use. But thankfully it has some really interesting moons. Titan. Titan is the only moon with a thick atmosphere, even denser than Earth's, and it's full of nitrogen just like ours. But down on the surface, it's around negative 179 degrees Celsius. It's cold. And instead of water, Titan has a liquid methane and ethane. Literal rivers, lakes, and seas made of hydrocarbons. It's kinda like Earth, but in a weird, upside-down type of way. So Titan actually gives us two possible habitats. One on the surface, where any life would have to be methane-based and super exotic and one deep underground, where more Earth-like, water-based life could exist. NASA is also really into Titan, so they're sending a flying drone called Dragonfly there in the 2030s. It'll fly around the surface, land on multiple spots, and hunt for signs of organic chemistry or even life itself. Titan is a cold, strange moon, but it's absolutely fascinating. Next stop is Enceladus, another moon of Saturn. It's only about 500 kilometers across, but it has some interesting features. Enceladus has a global ocean under about 20 kilometers of ice, and tidal heating from Saturn keeps that ocean liquid. There are cracks on the surface of Enceladus nicknamed Tiger Stripes, and these let the water shoot out into space as giant plumes of vapor, ice, and organic molecules. And Cassini flew through these plumes and sampled them directly. It found water, carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, organic compounds, even molecular hydrogen, which could be used as food by microbes. And it also found phosphorus, so that means all the six essential ingredients for Earth-like life are there. So Enceladus checks all the boxes. There's liquid water, the right chemistry, a source of energy, and an environment that's kind of like Earth's deep oceans, where life thrives without sunlight. So if there is alien life out there, Enceladus might be its home. Now we're going to travel to the farthest planet in our solar system, Neptune. But before we do that, let's just get a good cinematic shot of Uranus as we pass by. Now we're out by Neptune, and there's Triton, one of Neptune's moons. It's a really weird moon that doesn't get nearly enough attention. It's freezing cold, like negative 235 degrees Celsius, but somehow it still shows signs of active geology. Scientists think Triton might be hiding a subsurface ocean, kept warm by leftover heat and maybe a little tidal flexing from Neptune's gravity. And if that ocean is real, and especially if it's touching rock, it could be habitable, at least for microbes. Triton's also loaded with organics, and in a lot of ways it might be kind of like Pluto's big brother, icy on the outside, maybe liquid and chemically rich on the inside. But for now, it's all pretty speculative. We haven't visited Triton since Voyager 2 in the 80s, and until we go back, its secrets are still locked beneath the ice. Next stop is the dwarf planet we all love, Pluto. It's tiny, distant, and absolutely not the frozen dead rock we once thought it was. Thanks to NASA's New Horizon mission, we now think that Pluto has a deep subsurface ocean, still liquid today. Pluto's famous heart-shaped region, Sputnik Planitia, 
Its shape only makes sense if there's liquid water mixed with ammonia and salts under the crust, basically acting like an antifreeze. Even though Pluto's small and way out in the cold, its rocky core is still putting out heat, and the thick layers of ice above it help trap that warmth, keeping the ocean from freezing solid for billions of years. And again, if that water is in contact with rock, there could be chemical energy. The outer edge of the solar system might not be a dead zone after all. It might literally be hiding alien life. This is where our journey ends. But in the bigger picture, this is just the beginning. All of these incredible worlds, every moon, every ocean, every planet, are just part of one solar system, orbiting one star. And our galaxy has roughly 200 billion of them, all with their own set of planets and moons. It doesn't end at just our galaxy. Our observable universe has two trillion other galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars. Alien life could be within our own solar system. But if not, if these places are silent and empty, if these worlds were once home to a variety of life but then ended in fire or in ice, don't worry, at least it's not the end of our world.